Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are we getting on? So it's patch day once again. There's some really cool stuff here in patch 13. So we're looking at a, an overhaul of the event system. Some very, very cool changes to the camp system, which I'm really, really looking forward to. And the usual host of bug fixes and a brand new map for nuclear winter as well, which is really, really cool. Looking forward to trying that out. So let's get cracking, shall we? Okay then, so patch 13 night, September 10th, 2019. So, as I said, patch highlights, public events changes, design and balance updates, nuclear winter new map, nuclear winter global matchmaking, and some new rewards for nuclear winter as well. So, 7 gig on console, one and a half for PC, so quite hefty this week. Is uh, kind of to be expected given the scale of some of these changes. But, let's jump in with the general updates first and foremost. So, as part of today's maintenance, we've deployed a fix for the power armor system, which will unstack chassis that were never meant to stack. This issue affected apparent, approximately 9% of characters. So, you may well find you have some additional power armor chassis you didn't know about when you log back in, which is cool. With this change, some players may notice the following upon initial login after the patch. An additional empty chassis may appear in the character's inventory, stash, or both. Power armor may have been unequipped and moved into the character's inventory, so much the same as back with patch 11 when they changed a whole load of stuff. You might find the armor pieces in your inventory rather than on the frame, so worth having a look at that one. Especially as that would be bad to find out when you need it in a pinch. So, the other big piece of news is that uh, we are actively still looking to address the control lock that can occur when exiting power armor and plan to release a hotfix as soon as possible once we're confident that our fix will fully resolve this issue. Thank you for your continued patience. So this is basically the biggest and most frustrating power armor bug um, that is present at the moment. It's probably one of the most annoying bugs out of all of them currently present. That uh, when you hop out your power armor, the whole controls can lock up, you can't move, you can basically only shoot something that's standing right in front of you. And it requires a, you to quit at the very least to the main menu in order to fix the issue. So they haven't got the fix yet, but they are working on it. Um, I'm pleased to see that they're being open and direct about commenting on this, which is good. And um, basically saying, yeah, we're not going to put out a fix we're not confident in. Good. There's enough problems when they are confident, let's not have any more. Um, and they're also going to put it out as a hotfix as soon as they are confident, which is really good to know, because we won't have to wait any longer than we absolutely have to, which is good news. I know a lot of us would like to have seen this particular fix included with this patch, or already, but obviously this is not as simple to fix as uh, it might appear, and they are working on it, and we'll get the fix as soon as they've got a reliable one, which is definitely the right way of tackling that. So, big piece of important news, and I think something to look forward to. So, public events. This was what we covered in the, the most recent blog post. The event system has received quality of life improvements based largely on community feedback, and select events have been reclassified as public events. These events feature new UI improvements, as well as several mechanics adjustments. So as I say, we went over these last week on Thursday, but in reasonably quick time, the changes are the UI changes. Public events now feature a larger and more noticeable map icon compared to normal events. Uh, highlighting an active public event on the map now displays a dialogue box that offers more details, such as how many players are participating, how much time has passed since the event began. They're not actually able to tell us how much is left because that varies on too many different factors. So, at least you see, you get a general idea from how long the event's been running. I have a general difficulty rating, which is based more on the complexity of the event's objectives than the difficulty of the enemies. Although that does vary by event to some degree, for example, Encrypted, which is solely focused on being a boss fight, is uh, obviously focused more on the toughness of the Imposter Sheep Squatch. And it also includes the type of gameplay offered by that event. So, so far they've only told us about boss type gameplay and defense type gameplay. We're looking at, say, Encrypted for the boss type stuff, and defense would be more like, say, Line in the Sand, something like that. But there are clearly other types as well. We'll have to see when we jump in. Public event loading screens will now display more detailed event descriptions, including tips for success. So as you fast travel to the event, you will find that uh, the information appearing on your loading screen is actually directly relevant to the event you're going to, hopefully. Which is cool, that's actually quite a practical little change that's nice, that's worth having, particularly when it comes to new events, as and when they introduce those as well. You'll have a better idea of what you're doing when you first jump in. 
And when a public event begins, all players on that world who have reached level 7 and are not inside a vault will receive an announcement in the top left corner of the screen. Cool, so you should now be able to catch those um, big public events, the ones you particularly want to do as they go live, much more easily than you could currently. Hunting for them on the map every five minutes was a bit of a pain, really, not really the most user-friendly way of doing things, so... A good change there, I think I'm very pleased with that one, it's one that uh, I've spoken about before as being a good approach, so... Mechanics changes. So, first and foremost, fast travel to public events is now free. I know some people are considering using public events as a, a free way of fast travelling around the map, which kind of makes sense if they've got one going off somewhere near where you want to be. You can significantly reduce the cap cost of travelling, so... Not a bad idea, but uh, yeah, if you're going over to do a public event, that'll cost you nothing now. Fast travel from wherever you are on the map, which is... Again, not a massive change in many ways, but I think a welcome little one, nonetheless. Players no longer drop junk on death during public events in adventure mode. So obviously you still will in survival mode, and obviously there are no public events in nuclear winter. Instead, 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 the respawn timer will now increase with each successive death up to a maximum of 20 seconds. So in short, you've got basically a delay on getting back in to motivate you to try and avoid dying. But uh, the hassle of running around in the middle of a big busy public event trying to get your junk back should no longer be an issue. Good. It also means you won't have to detour on the way over there. You've Previously, you have to head over to your camp and drop your junk off, and then go to the event. It was a whole extra step that was just kind of unnecessary. So that won't be a problem anymore, which is cool. Public events feature a period of time that players can use to gather and coordinate before starting events. So you get a little bit of time to make your way over there and join the group, well, join the event anyway, before it actually kicks off, which is handy. After entering the event area or fast traveling to the event, a timer will be displayed to show how long players have left to group up and make plans. Players can complete a starting objective to begin the event early, for example turning on the boilers during tea time. If no players are in the event area and no one has completed the event's starting objective when the timer expires, the event will shut down. Which feeds into the next point. All public events except Scorch Earth, Encrypted and Seasonal events... Okay, they didn't mention that one in the... Um, previous blog posts, seasonal events don't aren't affected by the global timer. They now share the same cooldown period from the start of the previous event until the next event begins. So, in short, it's a global cooldown timer. The idea between these two last points is that if nobody goes and plays an event, the timer will tick down and the next public event will start sooner. Basically, if, it's, if nobody wants to play it at a given point in time, whatever the event may be, um, then the delay between that point and the next event starting, which people may want to play, will be significantly reduced. It should keep things ticking over nicely, which is quite cool. Again, we discussed this last time, and I'll throw a card up to um, last week's discussion on this subject, because there's a little bit more information there at the ins and outs, and it's worth having a look at if you haven't already. So yeah, all in all, significant number of quality of life changes that should make it much easier to see what you're doing and what you're getting into with these specific public events. And yeah, hopefully reduce the cost to make it increase player engagement and mean there's more players involved in the events, which is, yeah, particularly cool. Particularly events like um, Project Paradise and Encrypted and things like that, big events. You really do need a good, good number of people there to complete those events, unless you're crazy high level and high power. But uh, it should make those a lot more viable and make it a lot more achievable to get in there and actually get those good rewards out of it. Worth mentioning, of course, that with Encrypted, the events like that and Scorched Earth, um, those will not be part of the global timer, largely because they have specific conditions to start the event, like launching a nuke or using the uh, recall card. As I say, do check out the uh, video from last week if you want a few more details, there's quite a lot in there. There's also a list of all the events that have been changed over to this new public event system. It features most of the big and um, high rewarding events, but smaller ones like, say, the um, Horde events, stuff like that, those are not included, so worth having a look at that list. You can also uh, hit up the link here if you want to, and of course I will throw a link to the patch notes down in the description as well. So, design and balance updates. Energy weapons now benefit from armor penetration effects, including those provided by perk cards. For example, energy weapons with the anti-armor legendary attribute will now bypass energy resistance. Up until now, they have basically been doing nothing, so my anti-armor Gatling laser that I'm toting around on my 
main streaming character at the moment. If you haven't checked out the stream, you totally should. It does have that anti-armor effect, and it doesn't do anything at the moment. So as of today, that gun should get significantly more effective, which I'm very, very happy to see. And of course, it applies to all the others as well, which is cool. So the idea being that ballistic weapons will bypass damage resistance, energy weapons would bypass energy resistance, which makes sense. The hazmat suits can now be crafted, and the hazmat suit recipe can now be purchased from some train station vendors. A bit non-specific, I'd like to know which ones, but still. That should also mean they're available at White Spring, so that should narrow down the time it takes to search for it. Personally, not that bothered about that. I don't really use hazmat suits. I think most of my characters have got one, but I uh, hardly ever use it, mostly because you don't get any damage protection when you're in one. And if you're in power armor, then you don't get the benefit of the hazmat suit, so power armor is usually the way to go. But if you do happen to want to run around in a hazmat suit, you do so more easily now. It's cool. Mods. Bonus anti-scorch damage provided by prime receiver mods has been increased from 25 to 35%. For the most part, anti-scorch mods are kinda pointless, and increasing the damage doesn't really make any difference, because chances are your main weapon is going to be absolutely fine against scorch. The only thing they would be useful against is scorch beasts, except that they don't actually affect scorch beasts, so... You know, that kinda makes no difference. So, it's a change, but... Uh, I don't know why they're bothered, to be honest. There we go. It is what it is. Hopefully somebody will find it useful, but I don't think it'll be particularly interesting to me. Plans. The protective lining plan for casual Under Armour is now available for purchase from vendors at Harpers Ferry, Watoga, and the White Spring. If the player has already learned the recipe for resistant lining. So if you've got that first resistant lining for your Under Armour, you can now head over to probably the White Spring. It's going to be easier, so let's be fair and um, grab the protective lining plan from the vendors there and basically put more protection onto your under armor much more easily which is cool give you that little bit of an extra damage protection boost when you're not running around a power armor so interesting little change that i'm quite happy about i think i'll probably take advantage of over the next week or so small backpacks it's a new type of backpack, a small backpack, has been added in an effort to help more players acquire a backpack earlier during their Appalachian adventures. The plan to craft a small backpack can be found inside the Overseer's Cache inside Morgantown Airport. This plan cannot be traded, sold or dropped. So that will be the Overseer's Cache that's up in the main control room at uh, Morgantown Airport. So a quick run through there required if you've already done it to grab that particular plan. You won't be able to trade it, sell it, move it around or anything, but it's that easy to get, it hardly matters. So, yeah, if you haven't already got the backpack, you can get a half size backpack. It'll have 50% of the carry capacity provided by the standard ones um, quite easily from Morgantown. So, step in the right direction if you're into that sort of thing. I would imagine, as per usual, if you put power armor on, you'll lose the extra carry weight from it. But if you're not using power armor, a little bit of extra carry capacity for you. Small backpacks could be equipped with the same mods as a standard backpack and players can still learn to craft standard backpacks by completing Pioneer Scout quests. So, in short, um, if, if it's the same mods, I would basically imagine you'll still have to acquire those by completing the Pioneer Scouts quest line and doing the challenges to get the possum badges and then therefore being able to get the plans for the mods. So, still a bit of a hassle to get those extra mods for the small backpacks as well, but Carry capacity wise, you can grab that much more easily and get a little boost, which is nice. The Purveyor. When purchasing weapons from the Purveyor, players now have a chance to receive legendary versions of the following weapons, as long as the player has already learned the recipe for the base weapon. So if you've already found the uh, necessaries to build them, you can now get a legendary Sheep Squatch Club, Sheep Squatch Staff, Shepherd's Crook, Legendary Fixer, and Legendary Bear Arm. Not familiar with Bear Arm personally, but. I know the fixer is quite popular amongst um, stealth characters, so you can now get an even more powerful version of it, which is cool. Uh, the downside to this, obviously, is more options in the RNG list, so it does mean you, if you're looking for something else, it's that much harder to get. Well, if you're looking for these as well, you've got more options that could possibly appear, but on the other hand, if you're into those particular weapons and that's something that you're, look that you're looking for, you can have a better chance of getting them now, which is cool. So, train stations. Atomic shop access points have been removed from train stations. To be honest, not sure why they put those in the first place when you can already 
access the Atomic Shop directly from your map anywhere in game anyway, so that, that was always a bit of a strange choice. I'm guessing they've been removed because they're not getting used, and they basically just clutter up train stations today. Probably a sensible change. Vault 94 rewards. So the XP rewards for completing Vault 94 missions have been increased to 1600 for novice, 1800 for standard, and 2000 for expert. I'm not sure what the basic one already was. I'm guessing 1000, 1500, something like that. So it's a little boost to the XP you get for completing the Vault Raids. Additionally, Expert Midquest XP reward has been increased to 1000. And the drill has been removed as a possible legendary reward from uh, completing a Vault 94 mission. Which is good, because it's not supposed to be there. I'm surprised it took them this long to do it, to be honest. But there we go. So this is a good step in the right direction regarding the rewards from the Vault Raids, but I still feel that the rewards you get are outweighed by the cost of running the Vault, reward, the vault Raids. Um, they are fun, um, once they iron out a few more kinks, which sadly they haven't mentioned anything of here. There are a number of bugs in the Vault Raids. There are a couple of bug fixes here, but um, still some major work to be done, I think. I'm guessing that's going to take a while. These things often do. It's The Vault Raids have not been out very long in the grand scheme of things, so fixing these things will take them a little bit longer. But, as regards the rewards, I think it's, as I say, it's a step in the right direction, but I think they could, they need to be more substantial than they are. At the moment, you get a legendary weapon and, well, a legendary something, and um, then the necessary pieces towards building the unique armors. But that's only if you do the standard or expert missions. You don't get the armor stuff if you do a novice run. Given the cost in stim packs right away, ammo of running the vault raids, really need to have a really, really worthwhile reward at the end. And a step in the right direction, but this still isn't it. Need to up the game there, Bethesda, I think. I think uh, without that, then we're going to find a lot of players that kind of don't, okay, that was fun, but not worth it anymore, so I won't bother. And that's a little sad, really. So, yeah. A few more bug fixes required, but I'm sure they are working on those. And definitely boost that reward uh, from the Vault Raid significantly more than they have done here. But something is better than nothing, I suppose. So, quests and events. This one's a good little um, change. One that my main streaming character at the moment is going to be taking advantage of. Bucket List now appears on the personal terminal, and which can be unlocked for free in the Atomic Shop, by the way, if you haven't done that already. And it will now include an entry that will lead players directly to the current location of the Tourist Corpse. A little quality of life improvement designed to help players more easily begin the Bucket List quest and obtain a Pro Snap Deluxe camera. So if you're looking for it, rather than having to find a location and then just server hop or something like that, you can now just look it up on your terminal and go straight there and just have a right around when you get there. So, yeah, that speeds up uh, getting started and removes the element of uh, RNG, for the most part, to finding the ProSnap Deluxe, which is good. I'm definitely happy about that. It's a cool addition to the camera, and it's quite a handy thing to have, so... Uh, I know my streaming character, as I say, is in need of it at the moment, particularly to advance the Pioneer Scouts quest line. So, I will certainly be taking advantage of this and grabbing that camera just as soon as I can, I have to admit. Prospect of server hopping for it was not particularly appealing to me, so I'm quite happy to see I'm not going to have to do that now. Very, very cool. So, the Atomic Shop. Several new items have been added to the Atomic Shop with today's update. Catch a brief description below and look out for today's Atomic Shop article on fallout.com for more details. So, as of recording, this article is not actually present, so I can't go over that for you. But um, as and when it is, I'll try and drop it a link to it in the description, otherwise fallout.com you can search for it yourself if you want to. Um, but yeah, there's some really cool things here that I think particularly affecting camps that um, I am very, very excited for, hence the uh, earlier meme. And yeah, I'm really keen and excited about these. They're really cool things and they're additions that I think a lot of us, particularly who are into the building side of things, are going to be finding very, very welcome. So, first things first, new utility items. Collectron Station, presumably is a Protectron you can build in your camp. After building a Collectron station in camp, a Collectron bot will search nearby areas for scrap and other simple items. Collectrons can be unlocked in the Atomic Shop. So, in short, you'll be able to build a robot in your camp, go off and do whatever you want to do, and the guy will potter around and find little bits of scrap and junk for you that presumably will end up in your stash, if you've got any space in it, I would assume. 
um, and then you can come back and scrap them at your leisure, which is a handy way to just casually generate scrap while you're out doing whatever you're doing without having to worry about it itself. It'll certainly avoid some issues surrounding carry weight as well. So where I wasn't willing to use, say, the uh, kits that you can get to send junk back to your camp, this I might be more in favour of. Um, I'm assuming it is a paid item. If it was free, I think they'd be telling us about that. So the next very, very cool thing that we've been asking for for a long time, and I am also very, very happy to see, is refrigerators. After building a refrigerator in camp, players can assign food and drink items to it from the stash to slow down their spoilage rate by 50%. Refrigerators can also be unlocked in the Atomic Shop. So again, this is working the same way as your player vending does, or your display cases. Just assign things directly from your stash, so they'll still be in there, but it will reduce the spoilage rate. Um, I'd like to see it as a separate container, but that just increases the amount of bits and pieces the servers have to keep track of, so that's why they're doing it this way. Same with the um, player vending system, so they'll definitely be picking one of those up. <laughs> so, new camp decor. This is the one that I'm really, really keen on. Wallpapers. So particularly with, well, with any of them really, we've had the same textures and same look to all the building pieces since the game launched. And a little bit of variety is welcome at this stage, I think. Particularly with things like the inside of the brick walls, that plain whitewashed wall is kind of boring. I think um, I'm happy to see a change there and a few options to update this. So, The modify menu can now be used to apply a wide variety of wallpapers to walls in the player's camp. Wallpapers can be unlocked in the Atomic Shop. Kind of to be expected. Um, I'm sure we'd love to have some free, but... Uh, obviously you can get them through the uh, through earning atoms via the challenge system if you so desire, or you can do it the other way that uh, must not be named. But yeah, having wallpapers and being able to redecorate the inside of your camp in a much more interesting way is something I'm really excited for. It massively opens up the personalization options and give a lot more character and um, homeliness, hopefully. We'll have to see what the wallpapers actually look like to your camp. As I'm midway through a camp build at the moment, I will definitely be jumping on this and uh, hopefully showcasing a few cool wallpapers. So, fingers crossed on that one. Looking forward to trying that out. I'm, I'm reasonably excited about that. That's really cool. So, an existing item update. White Picket Fences, which is something else I recently picked up. Players who already own the White Picket Fence set can now build an alternate version, which is cool. So, you've still got the uh, existing ones that will snap together. So, if you would rather have a snap together white picket fence rather than the existing uh, sort of wire ones, that's now an option which is cool. Hopefully that means they'll snap the foundations as well so you can use them as like balcony railings, that would be nice but either way, this is cool, we'll see when we get in the game and the fact it's an addition rather than just a change to the existing ones cool because it just gives you extra options rather than overriding the existing ones which I think is uh, welcome to most of us who are quite into the building side of things and UI crafting menus Weapon and armor workbenches now display the number of mods the player has unlocked so far for a given item, as well as the total number of mods available for that item. So, no more looking at hunting rifles and scrapping countless numbers of them to find out whether or not you've got all the mods for it. You'll now know you've got five of eight or whatever it may be. Which is cool. Nice, tiny little quality of life change, but quite handy. I think that'll be uh, one of those things in time we'll be wondering how we lived without. Yeah, good little change. Very, very welcome. And another very little change, players will now receive a stash is full message when attempting to assign items from their inventory to objects like vending machines or display cases when the stash is full. So as it stands, if you assign something to a vending machine, for example, from your inventory, it transfers to the stash and then assigns. Um, at the moment, you may just be scratching your head as to why that's not working. If the reason for that is your stash being full, it's now going to tell you. So nuclear winter updates. Big one being, we have a new map. So Morgantown is the new setting for Nuclear Winter now. Um, the game, the Nuclear Winter game mode has shifted in its entirety from the Flatwoods region to Morgantown. So all games for the next little while will be taking place on the Morgantown map, which is cool. I think the sensible reason behind that is that um, giving players a choice and splitting the queue in short is not a great thing. Um, in fact, there's the global matchmaking thing that we'll have a look at in a second. Um, it's clearly an effort to solve some of the queue issues they've got already, so... 
splitting the queue would be the wrong way to go at this current juncture for nuclear winter, so moving everybody is a good thing. Hopefully, from the sound of things, the um, the Flatwoods map will be coming back eventually. With any luck, they'll add new regions and new maps and new areas of the game um, and just cycle through them, maybe on a weekly or two-weekly basis, something like that. Keeps it fresh, keeps it moving on, and yeah. Even if you can't actually choose, means everybody's together so you won't you'll have less empty lobbies hopefully and should keep things rolling around keep things fresh stop getting too bored which is cool morgan town features a lot of opportunities for urban combat and some of the highest peaks in appalachia giving candidates a diverse battlefield to master yeah i think that's a fair description looks like it'd be an interesting area to uh, battle in we're looking at this on stream hopefully this week looking forward to trying this out Candidates can also take on new enemy creatures, including Assaultrons, the Grafton Monster, and Rad Scorpions. Yay, my favourite. Yeah, change the scene, change the monsters, makes sense. New limited time reward, this is more interesting. In celebration of our new map, we've added six new vault University themed rewards that you can unlock for free by completing Nuclear Winter challenges for the next few weeks. So, play Nuclear Winter, explore the new map, get free shit. <laughs> I think everybody's in favour of that one. These rewards include new apparel and new camp and new camp decor, so be sure to claim them while they are available. Yeah, cool. I'll be doing this. Definitely want those things. I'm kind of hoping they don't bind them to uh, ridiculously complicated challenges, because that would kind of be annoying. But uh, if they're worthwhile, we'll go for it. I'll have to get in and find out what they are. Global matchmaking. Now... I have slightly mixed feelings, but I have a feeling this will probably work. So for most Battle Royales, the reason you don't have global matchmaking, you have it region-based, is ping. Um, I'm sure you guys are already well aware of what that's like. Um, if you have people from all over the world, you'll have some people with ridiculously high ping, some people with fantastically low ping, and um, you end up with a serious disparity where you get desync issues, and you'll find yourself being shot around corners, you'll find yourself dying despite the fact that on your screen you appear to have won the fight or should have won the fight um, but the server will be like nah the other guy won it so that's kind of issue behind this on the other hand the time to kill is sufficiently high in nuclear winter that it will be less of an issue I think that will mitigate the effect to a degree um, so I think that will take the edge off uh, the other side of it of course is the reason they're doing this whether they've said it or not, is that often as not, we're getting semi-empty lobbies. I've seen nuclear winter matches with 20 players instead of 50. And that sucks, in short. It's no fun. Uh, by putting everybody together, they can reduce the number of instances, that you reduce server strain, always a bonus, and um, hopefully have more populated maps. So we'll have to see how this actually pans out. I'm hoping the ping issue won't be too horrific. But uh, if it is, then by all means shout at Bethesda over it. Hit them up with um, support tickets and forum posts and all that stuff and make sure we keep them informed of our opinions. Daily challenges. Nuclear Winter Daily Challenges are now automatically tracked in the challenge tracker that appears on the map screen. Okay, cool. So you better idea of what daily challenges are available to you. It's cool. We'll see that's only within Nuclear Winter, though. New weapons! Sultron heads and Gauss rifles have been added and can appear in medium and large crates respectively. Can't see himself using an Assaultron head, given that it does as much damage to you as the guy you're shooting, but the Gauss rifle I could see myself using potentially. The slow bullet speed might be interesting, but Gauss rifle's pretty hard hitting as a sniper goes, and pretty hard hitting if you use it as a shotgun as well, actually. So, uh, the slow bullet speed will mitigate that to a degree, which kind of makes sense. Although uh, sort of predicting player movements kind of even more challenging in Nuclear Winter than it can be in some other games. But yeah, cool little addition. Always fun. New guns always add to the fun, so you know, always welcome. So a couple of changes to perks. Deadman Sprinting's perk functionality has been updated. While below 50% health, run speed is increased at a greater action point cost. Overly generous, the chance to inflict rads has been increased, and the amount of rads in inflicted has also been increased from 50 to 200. So that is a big jump. So, worth noting, Overly Generous has just got a heck of a lot more useful. Rad Resist has also got a lot more useful. It, rad Resistance has now increased from 40 to 650, which is another massive jump. Definitely useful, particularly given the impact of radiation in nuclear winter, so that's cool. 
and Refractor is now doing 80% energy resistance instead of 40 as well. So, some underused cards getting a buff to hopefully make them more useful. Which is cool. A couple of sound effects changes, new audio cues playing when downing or killing another player. That's cool. And new main music, main menu music changes, i.e. you can now lower or mute the volume of the main menu music, a lot of M's, while you're queuing. Always welcome, hope these sorts of changes will be rolled out across the rest of the game, or hopefully we'll get some new music for too long, because I'm getting tired of that need to be a winter music. So uh, yeah, a whole host of fun quality of life changes, some really cool new bits and pieces coming to the camp system, and some really really good changes. Definitely excited for this one, looking forward to jumping into this over the next couple of days. So, as per usual, we've got a hefty wodge of bug fixes, as we can see. There's a few that I want to single out, um, if you want to have a look in more detail, and I would actually quite strongly recommend it on this occasion, because there's quite a lot of good stuff in here. Not as much as we might like, but still quite a lot of good stuff, so we'll have a look at some specific changes. Okay, so, the most interesting ones are to camps, crafting and workshops. Crops can now be sunk further into the terrain, and in most cases no longer appear to float on uneven terrain. There are some instances where crops may appear to float, such as on very steep hills, but this has been significantly improved. That's good. Definitely happy to see that. Fix an issue that could prevent players from placing crops in locations where they could interact with logs or collectible flora. flora. Get the right one there. So yeah, that's something I'm probably going to be taking advantage of with my current build, because there's some collectible flora inside my uh, current build area, so that's quite cool. Couple of good little fixes. Just an exploit that could allow a player to have more than four vending machines. Not earth shattering, but probably good. Floor decor. Not surprised about this change. The Future Tech World Glow can no longer be built if it has not been unlocked in the Atomic Shop. So, a little bit of a bug there. We knew that um, pretty early on that you could build it even though you hadn't bought it in the Atomic Shop. Um, in a unexpected turn of generosity that I'm quite happy to see, Existing globes placed by players who do not own this item have not been removed. However, those players will be unable to place additional globes unless they unlock it in the Atomic Shop. Not sure if that means that you'll lose it if you store it or not, but you might. Something to be aware of. But uh, yeah, it's a reasonably generous response to fixing an error they probably shouldn't have made, but there we go. Um, I've actually picked it up myself, to be honest. I've picked up a few bits and pieces recently, so... This won't really affect me, but it's good to know about. Locks. Locking a door and pressing the scrap store button at the same time will no longer cause the lock menu to persist on the screen. Haven't encountered this particular bug, but definitely good change. And fix an issue that caused the player to jump when attempting to attach a wire between two electrical objects at long last. As I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, that this one was coming, and um, yeah, really happy to see that. Hopping around and not having your wire attached is aggravating. So, very happy to see this particular fix. Not quite sure it qualifies as a bug fix so much as a quality of life improvement, but to be honest, I'm not really bothered what you call it so long as it's fixed. Happy days, if it works. So, items. Apparel, the Mr. Fuzzy costume now correctly appears in Camden Park Company Store Terminal. I'll shut that down again. Uh, and can be purchased by redeeming 150 tokens. So I'm not sure what the previous price was. I think it was higher than that, though. And apparently it was having some issues with actually appearing at all. Now you should be able to get it more reliably. Always cool. This one I like. Urban Scout Armour Mask can now be worn with hats and many open-faced helmets. I like this. It makes it a lot more useful, because before it took off most of your other uh, headgear, if you wanted to use it. And it's quite cool, the Urban Scout Armour Mask, in a sinister kind of a way. Plus, it's useful if you're in the ash heap or the mire, because it filters out toxic air. And you can now keep your hat on when you're wearing it, which is cool. Definitely like that, especially as it doesn't cover the top of your head. So, yeah. Very, very pleased to see that one. Damage resistance provided by Urban Scout Armour Left Arm has been increased from 12 to 25 to match everything else, as it should be. Scout Armour Mods, available for purchase from the Enclave vendors, now indicate which piece of armour they correspond to and can be correctly applied to that armour. So, a couple of bug fixes in there. At least of all that you now know what you're getting, what it does, and where it goes, which is helpful. Makes the scout armor less aggravating to use, to say the least. The power armor changes. The bright red tactical headlamps for T60 now appear in the correct locations. Opposed to the wrong location, I suppose. Which is good, that would look weird. So yeah, happy little change. 
Pieces of power armor that have been placed on a chassis and stored in the stash no longer appear for sale in players' vending machines, so you have to take them off the chassis if you want to sell them. Uh, makes sense. Don't really have a feeling one way or the other on that. It means your stash is going to fill up faster, I suppose, if you want to sell power armor, but most people probably don't buy power armor from player vending, at a guess, so things around that. If anybody knows what the solar armor is, I'm guessing it's a nuclear winter reward, but I'm curious as to what that is. Anybody wants to let me know down in the comments would be appreciated. But its self-healing effect now correctly heals the player while at or above 60% health. Cool. So, some changes to events. There's quite a lot of little ones here. Um, quite a long list, so I strongly recommend going and having a look at this. But they particularly affect distinguished guests. Crikey, I can't spell apparently. Let's uh, not mention that ever again. Free range, guided meditation, and several other ones that are really, really small fixes. So, worth a look. Uh, yeah, quite a few good changes here. Guided meditation, for example, is now spawning feral ghouls rather than super mutants. So, adapt to that if you happen to be running that event. But yeah, worth a note. And not really surprising there are a lot of fixes and changes to events given that uh, events figure so significantly in this patch. Performance and stability. Fix an issue on PS4 where a player could crash when using a workbench with a very large number of unique inventory items. Okay, so performance and stability. Fix an issue on PS4 where a player could crash when using a workbench with a very large number of unique inventory items. Implemented an additional improvement for an issue that could previously cause a crash when placing fusion cores in power armor. Implemented an additional improvement for an issue that pre could previously cause a crash when exiting to the main menu whilst wearing power armor. Stability issue. Attempting to inspect and use a miscellaneous item at the same time no longer causes a crash. Addressed an issue that could cause a server crash. Always welcome those fixes. Fixed an issue that could cause the client to freeze during events with many participants. Yep, definitely good timing on that. And as a personal note, the maintenance last week on Thursday, I have personally noted, has definitely improved the servers. Um, I'm hoping you guys have had the same experience, but hopefully things will be running a bit more smoothly in general. The timing of this is none too soon, to say the least. I hope it continues to get better. Yeah, a little worthwhile note that Bethesda didn't add, but I think I would think it's a worthwhile mention there. Not really part of this patch, though, so... User interface. The hard. Fix an issue that could cause action points to continue to drain after the player stops sprinting. Particularly hope this has a, this is uh, the case when you open your pit boy because I've noticed that before. We sprint in along, open up the pit boy, you stop moving, but your action points keep going down. So, not an end of the world issue. It just means you have to wait a second for them to come back when you come out of the pit boy. Uh, on the other hand, if you get jumped during that time, a bit more of a problem, especially if you're a Vats character. Fix an issue that could cause rewards fanfare after completing an event to persist on screen or fail to appear. Fix an issue that could cause component view to display du duplicate entr entries or exhibit flickering. Haven't noticed the flickering, have definitely noticed the uh, duplicate entries in the pit boy especially when you're hopping into component view to tag things for search, so that should streamline that and generally be considerably less annoying. Fortunately you didn't have to tag multiple things, it kind of did it for you, but that should Clean that up a little bit. And the vault shutdown timer now correctly displays for all players on a team after completing a vault mission. That's vault 94 fixed, which is good. Still a whole load of other issues they need to fix in there, but I'm going to have to assume they're working on that for the next patch. Big new thing. Fairly substantial issues that need fixing. These things don't happen overnight, I think, realistically. So a couple of changes to the world. Camps can no longer be placed in such a way as they block access to Miguel's campsite near Morgantown Airport. Fix an issue that could cause players to become stuck in a specific spot inside Vault 94 while wearing power armor. I'm sure that'd be very welcome. Fix a rare issue that could prevent the environment from loading when correctly when entering Vault 94. And there are also a few changes to Nuclear Winter. It's a whole load of small ones, really, which makes sense given that, again, there's another update of the substantial scale to Nuclear Winter. So. Yeah, a whole load of bug fixes, well worth having a look at on your own if you would care to do so. Uh, I will of course throw a link down in the description if you want to peruse at your leisure. All in all, some really really cool changes, some really cool new items coming to the game with patch 13. Hopefully you guys will enjoy that this evening. Uh, apologies for this being a somewhat longer video than I wanted it to be. I'll try and cut it down between uh, now and you guys seeing it. 
and hopefully we'll make it a more manageable length. Uh, and thank you very much to those of you who've had the patience to sit through it to this stage. I very much appreciate that. Good going, that's hardcore. Um, yeah, a lot of big, cool changes, and particularly the camp stuff and a few other bits and pieces I'm very excited for. Looking forward to trying out the new nuclear winter map. Should be interesting, add a, a little bit more variety to the gameplay, which is cool. Definitely looking forward to it. And um, if you guys are... Um, actually, speaking of, there's one fix that I thought was coming that I haven't noticed listed here. And that is to do with the PC ability to add friends to um, your social menu. In that, currently on PC, I can't. Uh, Bethesda have mentioned this and did say a fix is coming, but it's not in these patch notes, so... I'm guessing that is still a problem they've yet to fix, which is unfortunate. But for those of you who are already on my friends list, then you may wish to jump in and join some nuclear winter games. So, you do. Keep an eye out for the streams. Make sure you've hit bell notification icon thingamajigs and all that good stuff, and then you get to see when I go live. If not, come hang out. We have a good time. It was worthwhile. <laughs> so, thank you very much for watching. Do appreciate you sticking with me for so long and uh, putting up my rambling. Much obliged. Do hope you found this video useful or informative. If you did, please do hit those likes and subs for me. It's very, very much appreciated. And if you're really liking what I'm doing, then please consider supporting the channel more directly via the join button and becoming a channel member. If you want to have a look, there's more details down in the description and you can have a look on the join button as well. The support is hugely, hugely appreciated. So thank you very much to everybody who's already done that. I very much appreciate you. For now, I will not take up any more of your time. So thank you very much for watching. And I look forward to speaking to you all very, very soon.